Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome to our first episode of the series. I think today we need to lay down the rules for what we're going to do. We can't just jump right into the story of ancient Israel. I agree. We don't even know where to start without assessing what the data is that we have to wrestle. Yes, I agree with you. And I think it's a good idea because this uh, will give us some sort of a methodological background to the series. Because uh, I think that we should first speak about uh, a little bit the history of uh, scholarship about Bible and archaeology and set some rules from the beginning. These will be the rules that we are going to apply throughout our talks, throughout the, the, the series. Now, obviously, we are dealing with the three disciplines here that need to be combined in order to deal with the history of ancient Israel. The first one is, of course, biblical exegesis because we are here because of the Bible, not because of this uh, cooking pot or that uh, storage jar. So biblical exegesis. The second one, of course, is archaeology, which is highly important. And the third one is the ancient Near East. So each and every one of them has uh, advantages and disadvantages. And I think that we have to uh, set the background first to explain this. So let me start with biblical exegesis. We need to be aware of several facts right in the beginning. First and foremost, that the Bible does not mean to speak history. The Bible is all about theology, about ideology, including territorial ideology, which really is on the margin of telling history, if you wish. But still, the reason is to speak about the relationship of the God of Israel with the people of Israel, with the Davidic dynasty, the centrality of the Jerusalem temple and Jerusalem in general, and so on. So we are speaking theology, and we, scholars, researchers, we need to speak facts and data. That's the first thing to say. Secondly, about the Bible, and we will elaborate later. Secondly, there is a gap between the ostensible events, or the events, if you wish, and the moment of composition. And sometimes this uh, gap is, very, uh, long, is a very long one. Take, for instance, King Solomon. You know, there is no question that the final touch of the Book of Kings is no, not earlier than the late 7th century, whereas King Solomon lived in the 10th century. So we basically have something like 350 years gap and then we need to ask a question how did the authors in late 7th century Jerusalem how did they know about King Solomon and this of course uh, relates to the question of composition of text writing literacy and so on we will speak about it when we come to archaeology archaeology is a different story altogether as the two of us know uh, very well I think I hope uh, first of all, archaeology is an experimental discipline. So in biblical exegesis, basically we are steering the same, the same path. Whereas in archaeology, every summer at the end of the summer, we, you, me and the others, we come with uh, new data and we need to reevaluate the situation. So it's an experimental discipline and this is important to remember. We need to, we, to, to be always uh, attentive to what's going on. Secondly, uh, archaeology, if done well, provides real-time evidence. Where we spoke about it a minute ago, that the Bible sometimes tells a story centuries after the ostensible events or the events, whatever. Whereas archaeology, if properly done from the point of view of chronology, dating, the moment that you are putting the spade in the ground, you know where you are, so you get real-time evidence. But the downside is that you need to know where you are chronologically, so you need to do it properly. And ancient Near East, we need to add one maybe comment 
that we are dealing indeed also with real-time evidence, which means the king of Assyria X or Y writes about his campaigns to the Levant or to the land of Israel. However, we are dealing with the royal literature, which means propaganda. And we need to know how to read texts like this. Israel, the Bible's been studied since the beginning, and archaeology has been going on here for well over 100 years. During the, that period, there have emerged a lot of different perspectives, different camps, if you will, about interpreting ancient Israel. Yeah. How would you address those? There has been a, a big dispute, a big debate, uh, Bible and archaeology, from the moment that archaeology came to the scene, from the, let's say, beginning of the 20th century, late 19th century. However, the dispute, the debate regarding the historicity of the biblical text started before. In fact, it goes back to the days of Spinoza in the 17th century. So uh, there have been two camps uh, till today. Uh, one camp, the camp of uh, the more conservative approach, more conservative scholars. They basically walk in line uh, of the biblical text. They use archaeology, but uh, in my opinion, basically in order to, uh, I don't want to be too harsh, but I would say it uh, uh, in any event, they are decorating the biblical text with archaeological finds. Okay. And uh, then there is the critical camp with the roots that go back, as I say, to Spinoza in the 17th century, and of course to the high research of biblical scholarship, exegesis in Germany and Central Europe in the 19th century, with big names like De Wette and Wellhausen and others. And there were ups and downs in the debate. So um, uh, the critical side they had the upper hand in the 19th century, any way you look at it. And then, starting in the 20th century, archaeology stroke back, so to speak, very conservative. Uh, way of using archaeology represented by the great scholar uh, after whose name this institution is called, uh, Albright, William Foxwell Albright, who was really an American genius as they called him. However, he came from a very uh, conservative background and this can be really felt in his research. So he tried to uh, uh, show uh, that uh, cr the critical approach to the Bible can be uh, brushed aside can be pushed back by the new evidence of archaeology. And when we discuss in the future, in the near future, the conquest tradition and maybe the United Monarchy, we will get back to, to this question. And we are now, then, then, then after Albright, starting in the 80s, I suppose, or 90s, uh, there has been a new wave of critical approach to archaeology and to the Bible. In fact, in biblical research, critical biblical exegesis continued in Europe especially uh, throughout uh, the 20th century. And in my opinion now we are uh, in a new phase of uh, uh, an attempt to show that archaeology can strike back at uh, the critical approach. Now I need to say a word also about minimalism because minimalism is used sometimes in the dispute without really understanding the depth of the meaning. What is minimalism? Because I'm, for instance, accused uh, sometimes or uh, listed, you know, as a minimalist. But the minimalism is not about archaeology. Minimalism is about the text. Who are the minimalists? The ni minimalists, who, in my opinion, had a very important contribution to research because they steered the pot a little bit. Minimalism is about dating the text. Whoever claims that the biblical text the historical quote-unquote parts in the biblical text, they come from the Persian or Hellenistic period, he or she is a minimalist. However, I am coming from a camp, a group of scholars who argue that uh, the historical parts in the Bible uh, were composed starting in the 8th century BC and in Judah in the late 7th century BC. So by definition, I cannot be a minimalist and I see myself as one in a big group of uh, scholars, most of them Europeans, who should be described, in my opinion, as the view from the center. 
And how do you know that you are in the center? Because you are being uh, pushed and kicked from, and, and, and from both sides. So the conservative uh, group uh, push you and de de describe you as a minimalist, and the minimalist describe you as a conservative, and so on and so forth. So I know that I'm in a good place. So all in all, what we are ultimately dealing with is a long um, standing discipline of history and history writing and the study of history writing has a long disciplinary history right. uh, with a, a wide number of approaches. What approaches do you think are applicable in this case? So indeed, I mean, uh, what we are doing, sometimes people ask me, you know, about my profession. So I'm, I'm not sort of saying, you know, I'm an archaeologist because I don't see my, I'm an archaeologist, of course, but I don't see myself, you know, as a, a specialist of the, um, uh, rim of the cooking pot or the storage jar or the base or whatever. I am an historian practicing archaeology, and many of us are. Once I say this, I need to look at the discipline of, of history, of course, and the rules and the methods. And uh, I, as, as you probably know, I am uh, very close in my uh, academic life to France and to uh, the French uh, institutions. And France has always been the lighthouse, you know, in the methodology of history, um, especially in the 20th century, especially starting, I would say, in the 20s, 30s of the 20th century, which means about a century ago. And I take from the French three uh, uh, concepts of studying history, which I think are applicable to biblical studies and to the study of ancient Israel, including archaeology and ancient Israel. The first one that is now very popular, and we all use it, the idea of a long durée, the long term. There's no way to reconstruct history but by looking only at the event. A campaign, a military campaign here, a construction there, things like this. We need to look at the long-term settlement history of the country, territorial history, what the Germans used to call territorial Geschichte, the terri and, and the French speak about long durée. The second concept which uh, I like very much when we speak about uh, history is again the French uh, concept of uh, histoire régressive. What is histoire régressive? It's like in English, regressive history, but it's a little bit different, the idea that's of regressive. Histoire regressive is that when one reconstructs history, it is a highly important to put you to stand on firm grounds. And especially for us, when we deal with periods when much of the background is dark, we need to stand on solid ground and not on, on, on quicksand. So, uh, and then once we identify the solid ground, one can start reconstructing back step by step. So for me, for instance, the solid ground is late monarchic Judah, late monarchic Jerusalem. In the late 8th century, in the 7th century BC, we have a lot of information about the material culture, about writing, about settlement patterns, about the historical processes, the cultural processes, and we need to start from there and reconstruct back step by step. step. Another, the third uh, uh, French concept, which uh, has uh, been uh, presented or suggested to us uh, recently uh, by uh, our friend uh, Jean-Marie Durand, uh, who is an Assyriologist. Uh, so he used the very tricky and interesting expression, uh, deconstruction positive, positive deconstruction which means reconstruction, yes, but be careful with your reconstruction, which means do not eliminate all evidence that does exist when you uh, deconstruct. So I think that when one applies these three concepts of history, from the methodology of history point of view, one is on solid ground. All right, Israel, let's go into details. Uh, what are your rules for reconstructing biblical history? So I have, uh, I think, 10 rules, only in order to make them 10. Don't misunderstand me, I'm not giving you commandments. <laughs> I'm giving you 10 rules. Let me start with a few, and then we can discuss them. Uh, some of them come from archaeology, some of them come from my understanding of biblical research. Archaeology 
is all about dating. That's the first rule. You need to know with archaeology where you are chronology-wise. And chronology-wise does not mean that you date a layer according to a biblical verse because then you are trapped in a circular argument because you don't know when the verse was put in writing. You don't understand the meaning. You don't understand the idea behind uh, promoting this or that story in the biblical text. So when I say it's all about dating, we are speaking about radiocarbon dating. We are speaking about independent evidence that can really set up in the proper place from the point of view of chronology. My second rule, the conservative camp, without maybe paying too much attention, promoted an attitude according to which one can pluck the history of the southern Levant, of the land of Israel, from the bigger picture. And this is a terrible mistake, in my opinion. And we will see this when we speak about, for instance, the collapse of the Bronze Age. The collapse of the Bronze Age cannot be read only according to the book of Joshua, let's say, you know, the, the story about uh, the destruction of the Canaanite cities, because the process in the Eastern Mediterranean was much broader. The same holds true for the question of the United Monarchy. We need to see, we need to look at the neighboring regions in order to understand. We need to look at Syria, we need to look at the southern Anatolia in order to understand processes of state formation, of the rise of the territorial kingdoms in the Iron Age. So this is the long durée on a temporal and geographic scale. Absolutely. Scale. You're right. Absolutely. What about number three? Well, number three we said already, so we, have to, we can put it aside. <laughs> number three is all about distinction between theology for understanding the biblical authors and facts and data regarding modern research. Number four is also extremely important. This is the dichotomy between Israel and Judah. What we know about Israel and Judah, archaeologically speaking and historically from extra biblical texts, because there is a problem in the study of ancient Israel. Modern researchers inherited the attitude of the Judahite, Jerusalemite biblical authors to the Kingdom of Israel. And we have to liberate ourselves from this, uh, from this uh, way of uh, looking at things. Which means we need to acknowledge that Israel was prosperous, more populated, a bigger territory, more advanced from the point of view of economy, administration, etc., than Judah. Judah was on the sideline, was one of those smaller and less important kingdoms uh, in the Levant until the destruction of Israel. So before the destruction of Israel, the big players were Damascus and Israel. And later, of course, Judah became important. There's no question about this, about it starting in the late 8th century. So this is the fourth rule. So that's the, the classic, the, uh, the victor is the one who writes the history. Absolutely. In this case, it's the survivor writes the history. The survivor, sure, who, whoever has the pen. Whoever has the pen. Who, whoever has the pen. <laughs> the, fi the, the final pen. The final pen. <laughs> who, whoever does the final reduction. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right, that's four. Yeah, the uh, fifth uh, rule is also important. This is the rule regarding how to look at the history of composition of texts, the history of writing, literacy, dissemination of literacy. Because for composition of complex texts, I'm not speaking here about the king saying, I killed X, I conquered Y. We are speaking about texts like the book of Samuel. In order to compose texts like this, a, a territory or a city like Jerusalem needs some sort of infrastructure of writing. Now, where is the problem here? The problem here is that uh, there has been circular argumentation here too, that uh, scholars dated inscriptions according to their understanding of literacy uh, in the Bible. Mm. Uh, because many of the inscriptions do not come from good archaeological context. So this gives you the flexibility to date them. And then there you have to be very, very careful. So in my opinion, this is wrong. And the only way to establish a 
good understanding of the history of literacy in Israel and in Judah is to look first and foremost at the context and work on texts, on inscriptions that came from a secure context. Leave all the rest inside. So first of all, establish a, really, a clear view, and then one can deal also with those texts that came from unsecure context. How many texts do we really have from this era of biblical history? Well, we have quite a lot, depends on uh, what kind of text. Let me give you an example, Ostraka. Uh, we have uh, altogether, I think, if I'm not mistaken, something like 400 Ostraka for Israel and Judah. About 200 and more of these, uh, Israel and Judah and neighboring regions. 200 and more of these from Judah. There are several monumental inscriptions from the region, from the southern Levant, not only uh, from the territory of the two Hebrew kingdoms, of course. Then there are incised inscriptions, then there are bullet, then there are seal and seal impressions. Uh, so altogether we have quite a big body and again we need first and foremost to look at the context. Always the context needs to decide and according to modern uh, arguments, and here we go back to it's all about dating, which means when I say modern arguments, I'm speaking about arguments that come from the exact, and, uh, the exact sciences, which means radiocarbon. Of all of the written evidence that we have that's contemporary with the periods that we're interested in talking about, it sounds like we're going to be questioning how early many of these texts were written down. And therefore, would you say that, at least for the earlier periods, there's no history in the sense that something is being documented in real time? I don't, I don't say this. So though I know today, and I think that I'm quite, quite confident about it, that the earliest evidence for composition of literary text, as we know today, if there would be uh, new finds in the future, we can change, of course, our, our view. Uh, but right now, the earliest literary texts come from not before 800 BC. So this indeed raises the question of how to deal with biblical evidence for the periods before, for the time of David and Solomon, for the beginning of the two Hebrew kingdoms. For the time of the Omrites, if you wish, in the 9th century BC, the, the great Omrite dynasty of Omri and Ahab and others. So how can we write history from the period before that if we have no literary or historical text? Uh, yeah, of course, it's a, that's the biggest question, I think, you know, uh, in reconstructing the history of ancient Israel, you're right, because this opens the way to say that, what, that whatever is pre-800 uh, BC is invented is not really history. I do not say this, because there is evidence either from extra-biblical texts, for instance, the participation of Ahab in the Battle of Karkar, it is not mentioned in the biblical text, but Ahab is there. Uh, or archaeology, I will get back to it in a minute, to show us that we do have evidence in the biblical text for periods before 800 BC. However, there was probably a long period of oral transmission, and oral transmission uh, opens uh, other questions uh, of how exactly it happens and how exactly um, tales and traditions are transmitted, what uh, is the origin and so on. From the archaeology point of view, which I mentioned a minute before, let me give one example which is very good, I think. In the story of the early days of the monarchy, in the story, in fact, of David before taking over uh, Jerusalem, if you wish, when he is a leader of uh, an Apiru group, an unruly group on the fringe of uh, Judah, the most important Philistine city mentioned there is Gat of the Philistines in the Shephela, in the lowlands uh, west of Judah. And we know from archaeology, from excavations there in recent years, that uh, Gat was completely destroyed by Hazael, probably by Hazael, king of Damascus, in the second half of the ninth century. And it was not an important place in the eighth and seventh centuries BC. So the, there is a memory of the importance of God that goes back to the beginning of the ninth century. And this is one example, there are others as well. Would you say that as a general rule then, what is early is less historical than what is later? 
Good question again. I think that uh, one can say this, but carefully. As I said before, we have evidence for historicity even before the year 800 in the 9th century. In my opinion, we can go back with memories, vague maybe memories, back to the 10th century. Maybe not much before, but back to the 10th century, to the beginning of the two Hebrew kingdoms. And then it is not even true to say that everything which is late is complete, is, is, is evidently history. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, the best maybe uh, period of uh, the three uh, Judaite kings uh, during the Assyrian century, Ahaz, Ezekiah, and Manasseh. The Bible says that uh, Ahaz was bad, Ezekiah was good, pious, and so on. Manasseh was the most villain of all Judaite uh, monarchs. <laughs> However, archaeology tells you a very different, uh, gives you a very different picture. Archaeology tells you that Ahaz was very successful in saving archaeology and history, saving Judah. Ezekiah brought about a disaster on the kingdom of Judah, the Sennacherib campaign and destruction, and plucking uh, areas from Judah, handing them over to the Philistine cities. And Manasseh was the great uh, comeback uh, kid, comeback monarch who brought uh, Judah back to life. So you see that the background of the story of the three kings is completely historical in the Assyrian century, but the content in the Bible is theological and not historical the way a researcher wants to look at uh, from the point of view of material culture, uh, territory, and so on. I think that's nine rules. What's the tenth? Oh yes, the tenth. Ah yeah. <laughs> the tenth uh, is something uh, for which I fight very strongly and uh, in my opinion is also an important rule and that is the idea that the transformation of Judah from a God-forsaken place into an important kingdom in the late 8th century was a result first and foremost of the incorporation of Judah into the Assyrian economy and Assyrian administration as a vassal kingdom but also as a result of migration of people from uh, Israel who ran away to Judah after 720 BC, after the takeover of Israel by the Assyrians. So one can ask why should they run away from uh, the territory of Israel? We are not speaking about modern times. I mean, uh, we are speaking about uh, antiquity. The answer should be probably that they were afraid. Those were the literates, the literate groups. And they have, they, therefore they had impact, strong impact on Judah. And they ran away because they were afraid of deportation. Because the Assyrians deported the literati. So they ran away, and we see this uh, in the population of Judah in the late 8th century. And the, the coming of the Israelites, brought, they brought with them elements of material culture and elements of administration and, in my opinion, writing but they also brought with them biblical traditions that come from the north. And they are quite massive in the biblical text. And in my opinion, there is no way to understand the historical parts of the Bible. That is to say, uh, books like uh, uh, Genesis and Numbers and then from Joshua to Kings without acknowledging the transformation of the population of Judah, Jerusalem and Judah, after 720 BC. So your 10th rule is really about one of the most important landmarks in the history of the region that contributed to the biblical text as we receive it today. Can we delineate some other important landmarks which impacted this yes, composition? Uh, I always uh, like to start with the biblical authors because I admire them. So the biblical authors, they would tell you, ask, ask a biblical author of the Book of Kings uh, sitting here today, uh, the answer would be, you know, United Monarchy, the secession of Israel from the United Monarchy, things like this. In my opinion, we have to take a broader approach and a broader view of the, and this has to do with not plucking the land of Israel from the background. We need to look at the big events that took place in the Levant during the Iron Age, and I refer mainly to the role of big empires or mini empires in the history of the region because the local 
territorial kingdoms, with all due respect, including the two Hebrew kingdoms, they were small kingdoms, relatively weak, not very important uh, on the bigger uh, map, if you wish. So we need to look at uh, Egypt, at Assyria, even at, uh, say, Damascus in a certain moment uh, when Damascus developed into a mini empire. So uh, I think viewing the scene from the point of view of geopolitics is extremely important. I'm, I'm sympathetic to your approach, but I think a lot of viewers out there, especially those with a more conservative approach to the biblical text, would immediately bristle that you're, you're trying to question uh, and undermine their faith. How would you respond to that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I am not here to damage faith or identity of people, uh, God forbid. I mean, I am here to collect the archaeological evidence, the evidence of uh, about biblical exegesis and the ancient Near East, present it to the viewers, and they can take from it whatever they wish. Uh, I totally respect faith and identity. I have my own faith and identity. And when I look at things, when it comes to the Bible, I would like to advise our viewers to give them one advice. I think that reading the biblical text in a critical way gives far better respect to the ingenuity, the amazing ingenuity of the biblical authors and their time and their distress, and their wish, and their goals, and their ideas, and their philosophy, and their theology. Great. Thanks, Israel. That ends our introduction. I think next time we can jump right into the history. Right. Let's do it. I'm looking forward.